Well, what if I just, this is what, we had at some what if I get Shayla's, uh, So what we, I was telling about the, the question comes in or whatever. Um, so the, it's gone. So yeah, well, it's the zoom bar is already gone. But if you escape, it brings yeah. it back. Okay. But see these. But what I'm saying is these guys don't need it. Yeah. Right. I, I need. I need to stop all over here. But they would have to turn it off here when it pops back up. Get it back on. What are the uh, <laughs> can't get it to come down. There's the hide. Are any of those stop recording or? Oh, yeah, the big red, the red thing there. I'm just thinking somebody that's nervous is going to, you know, could. Not the, I'm not as concerned about the recording as the broadcast. Right. Um, all right. Well, I let's. Not see the other one. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get started. Welcome, everyone, and Ramadan Kareem. I'm Andy Arsham from Bemidji State University and North Hennepin Community College. And I am Rachel Smith Bolton from the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. And we are so excited to welcome you to the Equity and Inclusion Plenary Session. The reason behind having a standalone plenary session is that we don't want to force ourselves as a community to have to choose between science and inclusion. We wanna really embrace the challenge and the impact of both. So building inclusive research and training spaces has its own growing body of theory and evidence. 
uh, and methods. And so the goal of this plenary session is to help spotlight and share those, um, those practices. And so just a few reminders as we get going, uh, be advised that we will be following the GSA code of conduct for this session. Please silence your cell phones. Masks should be worn at all times in this session. The session is being recorded. And our first speaker is Shayla Katadia, who will be talking about collective action for institutional transformation. Oh, yeah. okay, hello everybody. Um, this is the first talk I've given in person in two years. So excuse me if I'm a little nervous. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for the invitation. Um, thank you all for attending. It's great to see that this is a topic um, within the conference that isn't like competing with other topics at the same time. So I'm appreciative of that. Um, so I'm Shayla Katadia, I'm the Director of Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Stanford School of Medicine in their Human Resources Group. And um, what, how I wanted to start was just an introduction about myself. Um, when I used to come to this conference when I was in science, and um, one thing that I noticed is that we don't share who we are as humans, and that's a uh, important part of just interconnectedness. And so I wanted to start sort of start that way. Okay, what do I do to make it go? Okay, thank you. Um, so I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Um, my parents' um, house, the house I grew up in, was on the landing path of O'Hare Airport. So, you know, planes flew by three a minute in the summertime, and um, you can look out of the plane and see the house. So needless to say, it was a low-income neighborhood. Um, and um, I think uh, my neighborhood, being a child of immigrants, and my experience through the educational system really shaped me doing this work. Um, so some of my identities is that I'm um, Indian American and some that's like sort of shown in some of these pictures. So in the upper left hand corner is a picture of a group of women that's multiple generations in my family. And this was for my nephew's wedding. This was the first time my partner, my son, and technically I'm pregnant in that picture. So my daughter, first time in India. Um, and we didn't get a chance to visit often growing up. So bringing everyone there was a very special experience. The middle picture at the top is me and my partner, um, my husband, Justin. We actually met in the lab together. We both worked in um, Bill Sullivan's lab doing Drosophila research. Um, and his family was very gracious. Um, to, to follow Indian traditions when we got married. So that's a picture from our wedding. I also identify as a mom. Um, that's my son, he's five, Remy and Siona, she's three. Um, they're great. They're cute and funny and also really annoying. And um, they also make me wanna do this work in a right way whatever right might mean, because I wanna think about the values that I'm passing down to them, especially the cultural values of who I am, what I'd like to keep from my culture, and what I'd like to change from the way I've been socialized. And then um, the picture in the lower left-hand corner is just a fun picture of me and my friend, Amanda. She is a professional dancer. She was a ballerina in the Washington Ballet. And, um, we partner to together to do co-creative movement on science concepts to make um, science and dance both accessible. So it's just a fun fact. I also think it's helpful. I don't know how many people are students and trainees here, 
but I think it's sometimes helpful to hear about people's professional path because there are so many ways you can go. And I'm just gonna walk through what the step was and what I learned. But I just wanna say overall that it was not a linear path. It was very bumpy and there were a lot of tears along the way. So um, I was in science. I really enjoyed my science, um, thought I was successful in it. But in all honesty, what I learned is that the culture wasn't as welcoming as I needed it to be. And so that made me want to leave in addition to many different factors. I don't think it was the right lifestyle for me. Um, so, you know, that's part of the motivation for me doing this work because I want to change and transform the environments that you all are in so you can have a sustained career. Um, well, then I left and I went to science policy at the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Well, what I learned here was that science policy and politics, not for me. Um, but what I learned was being outside of the lab and being in a nine to five Monday through Friday job, really for me, loved not working on the weekends, loved not working in the evenings. And so that made me feel like, okay, I can do something outside of the lab. I had done a lot of volunteer work around education and outreach. And so I thought, why not do that for a career? And so I moved to a synthetic biology research center at UC Berkeley. And um, what I noticed is that they didn't have someone on staff doing the diversity work. And so I asked if that could be part of my position. And that's sort of how I officially transitioned to this field. Um, what, what I learned here was that I was doing a lot. I got to like produce videos and made a book and did a lot of science communication stuff in addition to running educational and outreach programs and doing um, national diversity work. And really the diversity piece is what spoke to my heart and that's where I wanted to stay. And so that's how I transitioned to justice, equity, diversity, inclusion work. I started off in the division of equity and inclusion at UC Berkeley, which is sort of like taking a master class in this field before I moved to Stanford. And the reason I moved to Stanford is because I needed a stable career position. And my Berkeley position was on short-term contracts and it was part-time and I was trying to watch a kid and do everything I could to make money. And that was just not sustainable. So now I'm at Stanford and now I'm in HR, which is a new experience for me. And what I love about being in HR <clears throat> is that I get to work with staff in particular. And also it's the place in the institution where policies and practices and processes are done. And then I have the ability to change systems because I can change policy. Okay, so that was just an intro. I hope people are still listening and interested. Um, but now I wanna transition to the part of my talk about transform, how, you know, how can you transform institutional culture in an institution? And what's a different approach that we can do to, to or a different approach we can take in order to achieve that? And what I see often happening in my past positions and current position in our higher ed institutions is a thousand flowers blooming. And like the field isn't big enough. Like we don't, we don't need a thousand flowers in this space. What we need is people to work together and bring their voices together so their voices are louder to make the change we really need to see. But when you're in a decentralized institution, it's very difficult. And what happens with a thousand flowers blooming <clears throat> is people get exhausted. There's um, too much division of labor and people get burnt out and, and we see that. And, the people who are getting burnt out are those who are marginalized in our institutions. So it's a double effect. And so one thing I really um, work on in my position is how do we work 
centrally and collectively on um, justice and equity work. <clears throat> and so this diagram sort of depicts how we build strategic partnerships at Stanford School of Medicine. So the School of Medicine Human Resources Group JEDI team, which is a team I lead, um, is in the center. We want to affect our HR department as well as our broader HR community. The DFAs are the directors of finance and administration and unit leaders. These are the highest level position, staff positions in each department. And then we have a School of Medicine Staff JEDI Collective. <clears throat> and that has rep one to three representatives from every department or unit in the School of Medicine. So there's about 70 people in this group. So we are constantly engaging them. And what we're doing is there's a ring connecting them because we are putting into place structures when we work with them saying that you need to connect to each other as we're doing this work. We don't want people in silos. And that includes the department and unit DEI committees. <clears throat> in addition, overarching that being in the School of Medicine, we are a part of Stanford University and Stanford Medicine. Stanford University has HR and we try to work with them. Stanford Medicine has affiliated hospitals and we try to work with them. And that can be very tricky at times. So what I'd encourage as you, you know, think about takeaways or what you can use from this talk is if I erased everything, all the words or the letters from this diagram, if you put yourself in that center circle, how would you fill that out with how you're building partnerships for sustainability for your efforts? So the reason I'm talking, about, well, I wanted to define collective impact um, since that's what I'm encouraging. And then I'm gonna show you an example of how we're doing collective action. So collective impact has five key components. Um, one, you need a common agenda. So everybody is coming together with a common understanding of the problem and a joint approach to solving the problem. And you agree upon the actions you're gonna to take to come to the solution. Um, that doesn't mean it's unanimous. I heard a chief diversity officer once say that for some reason in DEI, we expect decisions to be unanimous, but in every other area, majority is okay. And so we need to think about that dichotomy. And when you're building a common agenda, the expectation that everybody is gonna be on board 100% in an agreement is just, that's not real and disagreement is okay, but you eventually have to get to a shared vision. And then you have to have shared measurement. You have to have metrics and assessment um, <clears throat> that can cut across the project. If there's multiple you know, prongs to the work, the, the activity should mutually reinforce one another. Um, <clears throat> so that basically means you can be doing like five or six different things, but how do they connect to each other? And how do they help make an impact on each other? There needs to be continuous communication. This is probably one of our biggest struggles at Stanford. It's so decentralized that it is hard to get um, communication out. And then you wanna build on top of that honest and transparent communication. So you really need to think about your strategy, right? You're you, building a communication strategy across what you're doing is really important. <clears throat> and then I think the biggest key is having backbone support. So. Who are the funded staff who are dedicated to doing this work and making sure that those other four parts are being done essentially? Um, if you don't have that backbone support and you're not funding you know, individuals to actually do this work, it's probably not gonna be done in a way that's as meaningful as it can be. So just to give one example is um, we are doing a project with the collective <clears throat> and the way we came to this project plan was through collective decision-making. So for all 70 members, we did an intake form, which is basically like a survey. 
um, fed back to them the results, had them vote on priorities. The priority they um, chose was organizational change for JEDI. <clears throat> so that's what we set out to do. I've gotten asked before, why that topic? <clears throat> and I believe it's because there is so much, well, at least at Stanford, there's a lot being offered around our personal and interpersonal and transformational individual journey, but we're not talking about how we're changing our systems. And we can all change um, our behaviors and the attitudes, but until you also change the systems, we're not gonna see the transformation around our institution that we really need to see. And so that's how we came about this topic. And we use the employee experience, specifically the staff um, employee experience at the School of Medicine to come up with these five areas, which are recruitment and hiring experience, onboarding, orientation, and then having some value setting within your teams and departments. How, to, how do departments um, collaborate within the department and between departments? how we do employee education and advancement, it's like professional development. And then um, when you leave, either transitioning to another person or exit, how are you doing that in a smooth and meaningful way where you retain a relationship with the organization? And so we have a mission statement within each of these that builds out how you put a Jedi lens onto each of these topics. And then <clears throat> going back to that, ring, circle, square diagram I had, we wanted to make sure that the collective members who are sort of a grassroots you know, group have a central connection to the people who are making the policies and processes so that when we make change, we're doing it in a way with the people who have power in our institution, um, but hearing the voices of the people who need the change. And so, when I list that central connection, like talent acquisition, organizational effectiveness, and the others, those are from our human resources group department. So they're all, we're all working together to make this. And um, I wanna just acknowledge Matt Griffith and Miranda Stratton, who are two assistant directors on my team who are really that backbone support for this initiative. And we're early on, but um, <clears throat> what we hope to do is to offer some learning and organizational development modules alongside these toolkits we offer in these areas to um, educate people on how to implement these locally. And if we can have local change and this daily change in habits where there's a Jedi lens on top of all our processes that we do, then that's how we're gonna see the institution transform. So I'm gonna stop there and um, I do apologize. I have to leave right after the session is over because I'm technically here for my cousin's wedding up in Orange County. Um, so I wanted to leave some time for questions now if anybody had them, you can always email me as well. So thank you. I can start with one question while people are coming forward. I wanted to ask about this backbone support and funded staff member you're talking about. So many of us don't yet have that, right? And a lot of this effort is being taken on by grassroots and by faculty members who are just taking on additional service. So do you have models or description of what an entryway into having that backbone support would look like? Who would be the first person a department or a school could think about taking on to help support this? Yeah, I think in, it depends where you're situated. Um, <clears throat> I think, see, because I know Stanford's um, offices so well, I want to like cite them. But the, what makes me, what, what that triggers in my mind is, you know, what offices exist that you could partner with that do have funded staff? This is their job to do, right? Do you have a central DEI office? Do you have a position like mine, you know, in, in your... HR office or uh, as faculty development diversity office. Um, <clears throat> and then how do you make a case for hiring someone? So now what I see happening a lot 
is not only do we have these central offices for JEDI or DEI, um, I'm now seeing hires within departments. And, and I think that's, um, I think we just need more people doing this work. So it's also how do you make the case to your institution argument that you need more people? Because for me, I, for, for the first year I was in this role in 2021, I was a team of one. And I made the case, like, if you want me to stay here, we're going to have to hire more people, right? So um, you also, I mean, I think faculty, I don't have as much power as a faculty member to say that, right? I don't have tenure, but how do you say, well, I can leave unless you support these efforts, right? All right, question over here. Hi, thank you for... Uh showing as a potential solution to a very complex problem. And obviously at Stanford, it's already ongoing. Um, and my question is kind of two things. In a place where there's so many silos trying to work um, on probably common issues, one, how do you come together to break, not break the silos, but connect the silos? Mm -hmm. And then two, which may be more complex, um, we know that the change doesn't happen if we don't have really the buy-in up the top. So how do you go around to start initiating that kind of interest from the people that um, have the power to really invest on that? Thank you. Yeah, so to your first question, um, I think what helps is to understand what efforts are happening and do people have common efforts and can you bring people together around that? Also affinity groups, right? Affinity groups um, are a key place where this is happening and building community. And how do different affinity use groups cross collaborate as well? Um, so it's sort of, sort of just, at, it's also asking, right? Like who wants to partner and building trust. I think if you don't have that trust within the relationships then people aren't gonna work together. For the latter, um, I don't know if I'm the best uh, person because I am not necessarily the most graceful with navigating um, people who are at the very top. So rather I find the people who are <laughs> and work with them behind the scenes and um, try to influence decision-making. And that's, that's sort of how I've um, done it. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Do you wanna say what we're... Hi, I really, really love, 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 like your talk. I appreciate it. Um, so in the past few years, I feel like we have been seeing a lot more of an increase in DEI and Jedi efforts in universities. But one like problem that we've kind of been running up against is there's often performative mm -hmm. efforts by, by, by the departments and these higher ups, which I feel it can often sort of impede the, the, the actual efforts. Do you have any advice for how to actually reach these shared goals you have and not just get stuck with like something that doesn't actually accomplish anything. <laughs> yeah, so 100% agreed. Too many performative efforts. Um, it, yeah, I, I think it's a hard question to respond to because I feel like I'm always <laughs> criticizing because um, I'm thinking about I just, I don't want to see another speak like seminar series. Like we don't need 30 seminar series on <laughs> DEI topics. Like all departments get together and do one that, that brings in a lot of people and doesn't reach like 10, 20 people. I don't think you can just go and shout that at people, um, but maybe you can find someone like myself who's willing to do that. I think that's helpful because I, that's part of my role. Um, and I think you're also getting at the part I, I wasn't talking about here today is that personal and interpersonal, well, it's that really individual transformation. I think until people take the time to really self-interrogate their own identities, their own power and privilege, they're gonna continue to do performative efforts. And so it does take having some sort of program or 
journey, like we did this whole Jedi journey for our HR department that I did over a course of a year. And basically we didn't go to action until people went through that journey because I thought it was really important that they do the personal transformation before they moved into action. So it's also, you know, figuring out a way to encourage people to do that before they start doing the work. Everybody wants to jump to action. I don't know if that's helpful, but hopefully it's a place to start. Nice. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm at a place where the institutionalized DEI efforts are sort of in the early stages. And I'm wondering, based on your experience, what has been the greatest challenge that you have faced and how did you overcome that? Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. I think the challenge I have the most, especially being in HR, and this is not, I don't know, this is being recorded, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> All right. Um, I can ask you later. <laughs> yeah, I was like, can we, you know, stop the record? No. Um, it's people who think that they know what they're doing, but actually don't. And um, it's people who you challenge, like, you know, what are you doing in this space? And they will say all these things, but in reality, it's that performative piece. In reality, they're not really making the change they wanna see. And how I navigate that is, um, I don't sometimes, no. Um, I, well, one is just sort of in a kind, as kind of way as possible. <clears throat> maybe making the point that that's not true. Um, and with the, that Jedi journey I was talking about, um, it's, you know, when you're, you're doing some sort of curriculum around this, <clears throat> it gives you an in to sort of point that out in a, in a way that people have to listen. Um, but yeah, I think I have a lot of one-on-one -on -one individualized conversations with people who kind of, um, that that's what here, we're here to work on together. And so a lot of my position is coaching um, and coaching people to really, you know, answer really thought-provoking questions that challenges that notion that they know what they're doing because if you keep asking them questions, they can't really respond, right? Or they hit a barrier, it kind of allows them to self-realize and, and have to do that reflection. Do we have time? I know we're over time, so I just want to- Sounds like a dissertation defense. Keep asking <laughs> questions until the person says, I don't know. Um, we have uh, just a minute for one last quick question and then our next speaker. I just wanted to ask, you're speaking from a position of being in an institution and being in HR. For the, uh, us that are undergraduates and transitioning even to grad school or into business and looking at places that maybe haven't accepted us in the past, mm -hmm. are you recommending, since you brought up coaching, like, would you recommend people reach out to the HR department and try and find somebody interested in inclusion as they're going through that process? Or is that more of a step to take after you're already there? I mean, I think it's, so I think it's um, very institution specific. So, you know, if you're seeking, it's, it's um, understanding <clears throat> who in the institution you're at has this role, has the, you know, sort of. But like focusing more on trying to get in the door. So if you're not enrolled in that school already or you don't already have that job, and you don't meet the standard expectations, how do you try and go about finding somebody who can be an internal support for that process? Yeah, I, so I think it's understanding the institution and the individuals who are there to support you, but also talking to other people who are in the institution who are, you know, if you're undergrad, other undergrads, if you're a grad student, other grad students who are further along in their career and have that institutional knowledge, I think that's the key piece, that access to institutional knowledge, because those are the individuals who know where you can go, where it's safe, and where someone will actually push, 
and help you and not, you know, um, take advantage of you or anything like that. So understanding who those trusted um, advisors kind of are. Does that, does that? Thank you very much. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Todd Neistol, who will be talking about strategies at UCSF for addressing barriers in science that disproportionately affect people from marginalized groups. Well, that's where our okay, it's loading up. Great. Yes, yeah, so I want to start by um, uh, thanking the organizers for this invitation. I'm so excited to be here. This this meeting is um, I've I've been to this meeting I think every year for the past 15 years, except for um, exactly nine years ago today when my daughter was born. I missed that meeting, but uh, um, it's also just a huge honor to be able to be here talking to you guys today, and a, and a, a new experience for me as well, talking in a, in a public forum like this about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. Um, I think this it's uh, really an inspired choice by the uh, organizers to have a session like this where we can come together and talk about these issues. With the, the last presentation was fantastic. They can really got a good conversation going. I think um, many of us are thinking about these same kinds of issues and it's uh, such, such a great, uh, so great to have this opportunity to, to talk and, and learn from each other about this. I was listening to those questions, thinking, yes, yes, those are questions I have too, and, and we're thinking about that as well. So hopefully I can um, tell you a little bit about how we've been doing some of those things at, at UCSF. Um, so I'll start just by uh, defining that you know, UCSF, we consider diversity, equity, and inclusion to uh, cover a very wide range of um, uh, identities, including race, ethnicity, um, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, accessibility, um, and today, I, I want to discuss um, two of the initiatives that I've been involved with recently, but really there are a lot more and I'm happy to, to um, go further after the talk if people uh, have questions. Um, and so <clears throat> what I'm going to be focusing on today are two, two initiatives I've been uh, very involved with recently that are both focused on graduate education um, and are really tailored uh, to meet the, some of the goals that we have at UCSF. Um, but I will also um, uh, 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 emphasize the process that we're using and implementing these, and hopefully um, that process will be more widely applicable to some of you out there um, who are, have similar goals or different goals at your institutions. I also wanna start um, by just acknowledging um, that, uh, that these initiatives are just a, a small part of an effort at UCSF. There's a much larger effort at UCSF and also at universities um, around the country. And I'm really hoping that this will uh, just be the start to a conversation where you can learn from some of what we're doing and, and we, can, we can learn from you as well. Um, and at UCSF, the real key to the success of these initiatives is that they've been driven by real two partnerships between the staff, the students, and the faculty. Um, and in particular, um, uh, these two in our graduate division, uh, Dr. Liz Silva and Dr. Deanne Duncan, who are Associate Dean for Graduate, Edu um, for graduate Programs and Ass Assistant Dean for the Diversity and, uh, and Learner Success. Um, they've both been major catalysts in all of the different kinds of uh, efforts that we have going on on campus, um, and we couldn't be doing this work uh, without them. Um, uh, but so I want to get back to this sort of idea that it's really been a, a collaboration between staff and students and faculty. I think that is so important for not just spreading the work around, but also um, getting these different perspectives from different parts of the community and getting a really broad based buy in from people so that when we do come up with an idea and implement it. Um, there are uh, people, a lot of different people from a lot of different parts of the community have had a say in how it came about. Um, so I also want to say that the efforts of UCSF to recruit and, and train a diverse workforce long predate my time at UCSF, but um, the efforts have significantly accelerated in the last couple of years and I've really um, had the privilege of being a part of this surge in effort. And so I've thought about taking a step back and thought about, well, how is it that we're doing some of these things and what, are, what can I um, put on a slide that might uh, uh, sort of encapsulate that. Um, and I, I think that in some ways it really parallels some of the ways that we approach a scientific question. Um, and so what we do is we start with, um, I think this all came up at once, okay. Um, we start with, a, 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 by just defining a, a question or focus, 
we want to focus on, and then we gather data about the, uh, the current state of affairs. And I think this is a really important step. As we were talking about before, you can't just jump straight to action. We really need to start by understanding uh, what the problem is. And then uh, workshop some ideas and initiate a kind of a pilot program that we can use to then go to the university and say, hey, this is an idea, we have data, we've done a pilot, and this is, gonna, this is worthy of being funded. Um, and then um, once we have that pilot, we can build on that by modifying it as needed, convert it to convert it into something more sustainable, um, which then hopefully in the most mature stage, we're at a place where we can sort of periodically reassess and adjust as needed. Um, so to illustrate this process, I want to just tell you about two of the initiatives that I've been uh, uh, involved in in the last several years. And the, the first one, oh, I see this. Oh. Okay, that's what I thought was gonna happen in the last slide. All right. <laughs> um, is, uh, these two of the ideas we've been, uh, uh, two, two programs I'm involved with. One is uh, the Graduate Faculty Mentor Development Program. So this is a series of workshops and uh, discussions, guided discussions, trainings, focused on the skills needed to be an effective PhD dissertation mentor. And so although all these trainings are not exclusively focused on DEI efforts, um, We've approached them with an emphasis on how issues with mentorship might disproportionately affect our trainees from marginalized populations. So referring back to the, the process that I outlined, the initiative started when students actually approached the graduate division to uh, ask for help about access, uh, assessing the climate uh, for students at UCSF. And so the grad division worked with the student body uh, government to design and conduct a survey that assessed how the students were satisfied across a variety of dimensions. And very importantly, this wasn't just like a survey monkey with a few hastily drafted questions. They really took the effort seriously. They, they designed a professional survey in collaboration with our social sciences department um, and, um, and, uh, administer, and, and administered it in that way. <clears throat> and so uh, this really helped to improve the accuracy uh, of the survey and allowed it to probe for a lot more nuances. And then in addition, because of the care and professionalism that went into the study, the findings had a lot more weight with the community. So they were able to present it in this very typeset, sort of professionally done document with um, graphs and analysis of the findings and really clear suggestions for next steps. Um, so participation in the survey was really good. We had 347 respondents, which is a little over about half of the first to fourth years uh, in our PhD programs and uh, over 50% of the students from underrepresented groups. Um, and among these respondents, it was gratifying to see um, that there's overall very high satisfaction in key areas. So for example, 71% of the students reported that they were satisfied with their mentor. 78% of the respondents indicated that the mentor was effective at making them feel valued. But these numbers also indicate that approximately a quarter of our students are not satisfied in these areas. And so there's, there's room for us to improve for sure. Um, in addition, while nearly all students believe that their mentor is effective at discussing their research, a smaller percentage felt that the mentors were very effective at discussing their career goals. And in addition, important, the survey also revealed that while there was overall very little variation among different demographic groups, um, <clears throat> that, uh, that um, students who had uh, identified as an underrepresented minority were more likely than white students not to ask for help with their career goals, not to ask for help with graduation and to switch labs midway through their dissertation. So based on these findings and others in the study, um, the survey um, coordinators recommended improved training for both mentors and mentees with a focus on effective communication, setting expectations and mentoring across differences. Um, and so getting at this, one of these first questions we were just talking about, um, one way to really get the higher level university administration engaged is to start with this um, very uh, uh, data-driven and um, professional process that can become a foundation for your um, advocacy to move forward. Um, so to meet these, um, these uh, the needs identified in this study, we assembled a working group that included, again, both students and faculty and staff um, to uh, uh, workshop some ideas about the most effective next steps. And in this case, since the recommendations were for training um, and uh, that was something we wanted to focus on, um, we wanted, we, we wanted, we knew there was a lot of wisdom in our community about how this might be done. We wanted to take advantage of that. We also knew that these issues are very complex and require uh, expertise that is outside of our wheelhouse. And so we also wanted to bring in some outside experts uh, to help with that. 
And uh, to get us started, we invited Dr. Sharon Milgram, from, uh, the, uh, who's the, uh, the director of the NIH Office of Intramural Training and Education, to come and run a two-day workshop um, on the UCSF campus. And if any of you are looking to try to spark some of this at, at your campus, I highly recommend reaching out to her to see if she's available to come. She's really fantastic. Um, so during the first day, um, the graduate program faculty participated in what's called the Sharpening Your Mentoring Skills workshop that she does, which leads participants through uh, short presentations, case studies, and facilitated conversations that are designed to help um, faculty learn about uh, factors that are relevant for their distinct mentor roles, whether it's scientific mentor, career mentor, or supervisor, recognize situations where students may need additional support with career development or mental health or wellness, um, and learn to develop and discuss shared expectations with the students. These shared expectations are really important. Um, and then to recognize the impact of psychosocial factors and cultural competency on mentoring relationships. Um, so uh, she, there was about a four hour session. She led many of us all through it and it was very well received. Um, over 86, uh, I think the number is 86% uh, of the participants um, said they would recommend it to her, to her colleague. And over 90% said that it added value um, to their role as a supervisor, a career mentor, and a research mentor. And then after we did that and we were all energized, then there was a second day where she led a train the trainer workshop um, where they, she taught us how to, how to make our own trainings on, on topic on specific topics. Um, and so we, <clears throat> um, through that process, we developed a, a, a separate module on mental health awareness, which was uh, developed and conducted uh, in coordination with the UCSF Director of Student Mental Health. Um, and in that training, what we actually, besides learning about this, what we actually also did was uh, a role-playing exercise where we practiced counseling a student um, in, uh, who is in distress. And that, that really, really helped for us with all the emotional and um, uh, just the, all the, the emotional things that can be involved, but also uh, legal considerations, it can be very helpful to actually practice this before you might, uh, uh, be in that situation. We also developed uh, training on um, implicit bias, understanding the neurobiology behind implicit bias, um, which uh, drew in guest speakers and also used real case studies uh, from UCSF, anonymized case studies. And then we did uh, a, a, a workshop on acknowledging and negotiating mentor-mentee tensions in the research lab, which was uh, developed with our Director for Diversity and Learning Success. And so um, again, getting back to this idea of a pilot really providing a, um, a foundation for moving forward, the success of this effort and the surveys that we got back and the response from the community really gave us the, um, the, what we needed to be able to go to the administration and say, this is important and we wanna make this more permanent. And that allowed us to then uh, hire uh, this guy here, Dr. Isaac Strong, who some of you may know, he did his PhD with Pat O'Farrell, um, to come in uh, to our graduate division and uh, make this, these trainings and the de further development of these trainings uh, a, a permanent effort at UCSF. And so uh, Isaac, um, <clears throat> working with the faculty and students again, developed an additional uh, 20 trainings that we now have. Um, and um, they're all being, uh, this, this is just a sample of some of them and um, the percent of the participants who would recommend it to a colleague. You can see many of them, 100% of the participants are saying so. It's a very uh, popular program um, and we're continuing to develop it. A lot of them like these ones shown here in green are designed specifically with a DEI related topic in mind, but others like the setting expectations for a welcome letter are um, you know, not specifically DEI focused, but do uh, help to uh, create a standard set of expectations that promote inclusion and equity across the board. Um, and so, <clears throat> so we're now in this phase where um, we wanna periodically, re we're, we're periodically adjusting and, um, and reassessing and developing new trainings. And if any of you would like to see some of these trainings and get some ideas for doing some of this at your institution, you can see, you can find out what we've done at this website here, mentoring.ucsf.edu. Um, okay, so then um, turning now to the next, um, oh, I, I forgot before I want to, I also want to say, and now we're sort of five years out from conducting that student survey. 
And a really important next step for us is going to be to do another one of these very uh, professional and formal assessments of our community to see what impact this training has had, um, not just on people's satisfaction with the trainings themselves, but on change uh, to our culture. So that's, that's uh, to be coming soon. Um, so the next initiative that I wanna tell you about is uh, something I'm very excited about. We have a relatively new program that um, we recently started at UCSF called PROPEL, which stands for Post-Baccalaureate Research Opportunity to Promote Equity and Learning. Um, so the goal of PROPEL is to provide trainees from historically underrepresented backgrounds with the research and career mentorship needed to be successful um, and competitive um, applying for biomedical PhD or MD PhD programs. Um, the recognition for the need for this type of program started again with this process of gathering data, defining the problem and gathering data. And this time we we're looking at graduate admissions. And so using data from collegefactual.com, which agrees well with the data that we collect at UCSF as well, um, we can see that the population of students who received a bachelor's degree from uh, some of the local universities around UCSF at UC Berkeley and San Francisco State University is substantially more diverse than uh, the population of our PhD students. And so this, of course, is just a comparison to some of our local universities, but I think if we look statewide or nationally, the trend would be similar. Um, I should note that demographics data is not collected in the same way across these different places, so it can be hard to compare. And also, um, minoritized pop different minoritized populations face different structural barriers, so we, um, it's not, um, it's problematic to uh, frame diversity as a singular goal. We should be thinking about each of these each of these different populations differently. But nonetheless, the statistics suggested to us that we could be doing better to recruit a more diverse population of students into our graduate programs. Over the years, we've developed a, a bunch of outreach programs to uh, minority serving institutions and universities in California. Um, and we also have a summer research program that focuses on bringing in undergraduates um, from disadvantaged and, and uh, minoritized populations to the to UCSF to get research experience. And these efforts have um, really helped to diversify our student population. We've seen a, a continual upper, upward trend and no, no doubt in due part to these efforts. Um, but we knew that we could do a bit more and there were several uh, groups on campus who had developed solutions. Some of these thousand flowers blooming kind of idea. Um, and the Propel program came about through a combination of efforts uh, between a, a working group in the School of Medicine who was tasked with increasing the diversity of our uh, research um, staff at the post-baccalaureate level and PhD program directors who were uh, interested in, um, in increasing the diversity of the applicants to our, our programs. Um, and so there are a lot of root causes to the underrepresentation of minoritized groups in, in graduate education and many are outside of our control. But uh, one major factor in our admissions process that can be a barrier to um, all groups, uh, all people from all backgrounds, is the strong preference that we give to applicants who have had a substantive research experience at the post, uh, after either undergraduate or after graduating as a research technician. Um, and so indeed, this, this idea has um, really taken hold even more at UCSF because of a publication that uh, one of our graduate faculty did where they assessed the strongest correlates of uh, success in our graduate programs, looking at the application data over a number of years. And what emerged is that the strongest correlate was previous research experience. And so this is something that we really strongly um, um, emphasize in our admissions process. Um, but for a variety of reasons, these kinds of uh, experiences are not equally available to everybody and can be um, even harder to get for uh, students from uh, disadvantaged or minoritized backgrounds. So it turns out that the NIH actually has a, sub as a funding program, the diversity supplement program, that's available to fund students from disadvantaged or minoritized backgrounds to do this, this kind of research. And so we came up with the idea to start an event that would help to take advantage of this funding situation and provide this kind of experience. We call it the annual NIH diversity supplement matchmaking event. Um, and we had our first event in January, 2020. We just we invited uh, scholars who would be eligible for an NIH diversity supplement from Bay Area schools to come onto the UCSF campus and have these quick 10 minute speed interviews with UCSF faculty who had eligible grants. At that event, we had about 20 students and 25 faculty, and um, we, we had a great time talking to each other, but it was pretty disorganized, and 
there weren't very many matches that were made. I, I think I might have been the only one who made a match, actually. Um, but but um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very glad that I did. She's been doing fantastic in the lab. Um, but uh, then what happened was um, after that, the, the pandemic hit and uh, we learned about the, the, the wonder of Zoom interviews and Zoom meetings. Um, and we also just reassessed and figured out how we could do this better. And so we, we re-ran the event again in January, 2021 as a Zoom event. And that allowed us to recruit from um, all around the country. And at that event, we had 120 faculty, almost 100 scholars, and uh, over 35 matches were made in which a scholar came to do work at UCSF. Um, we just had the event again in January 2022 with similar uh, success rates. So um, we're hopeful that uh, many more matches will can continue to be made. Um, and so uh, information about this event can be found at justice.ucsf.edu. And uh, we hope to post more materials there um, that you can uh, use to implement a similar event at, at your school. Um, one of the keys to making it work better was that uh, we, we had better pre-survey events and then we, we developed an algorithm of which by which I mean like 300 lines of code to help match people together um, uh, and make the, the, the interviews more efficient. Um, so if you're interested, we'll hopefully we'll have more information about that there. Um, and as part of the organization of this initiative, we also um, developed a bunch of resources for faculty to apply for these, these grants. So um, it doesn't, it's not the same as a typical NIH grant. There are a lot of idiosyncrasies and it can be really helpful to work out some of those kinks ahead of time, um, like the job title that the person would come into, um, some of the, the different forms that you need for the application. And so we have all of that, um, as well as a, a, a kind of a repository of information about diversity supplements um, at this website here, guides.ucsf.edu uh, slash RDO slash diversity supplements. Um, and then finally, another really important component of this is that we went out to UCSF departments and institutions and said, hey, we're doing this thing. This is going to be great. Do you want to um, contribute? And uh, we, so we got them, uh, many institutions to give uh, individual faculty scholar pairs $10,000, uh, what we call um, uh, Propel Fellowships, to help cover the difference in cost between funding a fellow and, um, and what the diversity supplement provides. We found that departments were very interested in this as a way to support our efforts and also support their own faculty and their own groups. <clears throat> um, and so then uh, once we had all these scholars coming to campus, we really wanted to do more than just put them in a lab and we wanted to create a, an experience for them. And so to augment the experience that they were getting in the lab, we developed this po post baccalaureate program that we call Propel. Um, so the founders are shown here and you can see it's a mix of staff and faculty from several different departments at UCSF. Um, in the first class uh, in 2020 to 2021, we had eight scholars. <clears throat> and again, working as a team was really crucial here to help with the, working with the scholars and the faculty to make sure that we did this and implemented this in the best way that we could. Um, and the, the classes and events that we developed included um, writing a personal statement that they would need for their application to graduate school. Um, a graduate application discussion panel, um, uh, building a re building resiliency workshop. And again, we brought Dr. Milgram back for this one um, and a lecture series on different topics in biomedical science, as well as some social and community building events to the extent that we could given the pandemic restrictions. Um, and then with the success of the 2021 um, uh, matchmaking event, we were able to recruit many more. We, we had uh, 50 more scholars join the program in 2021 to 2022. And we anticipate a very similar uh, increase in enrollment again this year. So this is really remarkable. So for, just for some context, the, all of our basic science PhD programs across all of UCSF brought in 152 students last year. And so an additional 50 students coming through Propel is a 33% increase in students coming to our campus and our basic science labs. And all of these students are, from disadvantaged and minoritized backgrounds. In addition, this is way more than the four to eight slots that you would typically see in a training grant funded for a post baccalaureate program. And so I think what this is telling us is there's a huge demand for this kind of training and that we need to be thinking more creatively about how to meet that demand. Um, <clears throat> so the success of this program 
Uh, and again, uh, if you want to, if you're out there and like to apply to our program, you can, uh, or if you want to learn more about it so that you can develop something similar at your institution, information is at propelled at UCSF.edu. Um, and so the success of this program is the, has generated a lot of enthusiasm on campus. And many people have approached us with ways to help. And with these opportunities, we're now continuing to revise and um, adjust the curriculum based on feedback. And we're fortunate to get a small pilot grant from the university to keep us going for this year, but we're now in the process of trying to convert this to a sustainable program using funding from a training grant or some other outside source. And an important component of this next phase will also be to assess the efficacy of what we're doing. <clears throat> so looking to the future, um, some of our next goals are, um, as I said, to, uh, to now that we're five years out from the, the survey that, spawned, that uh, sparked the faculty development mentor program, faculty mentor development program, um, we want to redo a survey and see what kind of impact we're having. Um, and also now that our first cohort of Propel scholars are starting to apply to graduate schools, it's important for us to assess um, that and see, uh, see how that's going and really help to transition the Propel program from a pilot into something more established. At the same time, we're certainly far from done and we're always, we have lots more initiatives going on and wanna just wanna um, highlight uh, that we have been very involved in just in the past year is uh, the work that we've been doing through what we're calling the UCSF Graduate Division DEI Task Force. So this is a, a group of students and faculty um, and members from the Graduate Division who came together um, to discuss um, uh, the impact of racism and particularly anti-black racism on our campus. Um, so these were lots of very um, emotional and high, often highly charged conversations, um, but the group really uh, stuck together and came, um, came up with some very uh, tangible and actionable uh, items that we can start working on and produced a, a report um, in which all of that is described, shown here. So just uh, an example of some of the things that are, are in that report are recommendations for changes to graduate program admissions and the membership, the membership policies, as well as um, uh, increased funding for specific new DEI focused positions in the grad division and initiatives to increase the diversity of our invited speakers and our program faculty. Um, so I'll stop, I'll just go to the acknowledgements here. I, I mentioned several of the people who are really important along, along the way, but I also just, um, of course, many more people have contributed. Uh, Mark Ansel actually uh, conceived of the idea of this faculty mentor development program, and he and I worked really closely with uh, Liz Silva, Deanne Duncan, Fatima Saadi, uh, Gene Stanford, and Isaac Strong to make it possible, as well as lots of um, consultation with students and funding from the graduate division. For the diversity supplement matchmaking event, I worked with Yasmin and Jennifer, and Jennifer initially. Um, and then we recruited Ryan Hernandez, who's the director of our biomedical informatics program and wrote those 300 lines of code I told you about. And, uh, and Angel Max Aguero, and we're funding from the uh, research development office in the office of diversity and outreach. Um, and then uh, Mark, Ryan, Sam and I started Propel um, with a lot of help from uh, uh, Paul Bentico, uh, Jennifer Seifer and uh, Justin Yabut, um, and the others listed on here as well. So I'll stop there, and I have it. Looks like I'm out of a minute for questions. Hello, thank you. That was most excellent. I was really impressed with all the great work that you're doing and pioneering in this area. I'm Dr. Lee Allen from an HBCU in St. Louis, Harris Stowe State University. And my question is this, um, and you have your hands full. There's a lot to do here. Stan, I know you want to be focused, but have you thought of potentially having your Propel undergraduate students serve as Propel mentors for high school or younger? My concern is with the pandemic, we all know this, that a lot of students at all grade levels have lost out on science education, math, and other subjects. And so unfortunately, I think what's gonna make things harder, especially for the minority community who have far fewer resources, they're gonna be right, having to really tackle more challenges to look at careers in professional science. So is that something you might that, think of in the future? A it's a fantastic suggestion. And we thought a lot about the values of near peer mentoring, both about going up and down. Exactly. So these are post-baccalaureate scholars and we're, uh, we're talking with faculty at San Francisco State to uh, help connect them with freshmen entering uh, San Francisco State students and become a near peer mentor for some of them. Great, thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thank you. 
Okay, I am jumping in here because we are almost out of time. So I'm gonna ask the one question that's come through remotely and then ask those of you who have questions. These are great. I love seeing all the questions. Can you come up after, yeah, I'll be around after. and chat with Todd after the session, just so we don't run late. Um, the question that came through Zoom is, do you focus on African-American underrepresentation separately or do you lump all the sort of groups together? Yeah, that's a complicated question. We, we, to the extent that we can, we try to recognize that minoritized populations all face distinct structural barriers and to really meet these communities needs in the most individual way that we can. Um, uh, some of these kinds of sort of concept of a thousand flowers blooming and the strength in numbers comes from needing to combine some of those efforts. So it's a little bit of a mixture for us. All right, thank you. And our final talk for this session is Marguerite Matthews, um, and she'll be talking about NINDS strategies for enhancing the diversity of neuroscience researchers. I think I scared everyone away. They didn't, they were hungry. They didn't, they didn't want to wait to see what I had to say. So while that's being pulled up, I just have to say, um, these native lands of the Kumie is where I was born and raised. Um, I feel so, so blessed to be back um, in this space. So thank you to the organizers for the invitation, um, to the co-chairs, to my co-presenters for presenting. Um, I actually came out to society um, as a young lady in a debutante ball in this ballroom. <laughs> no lie, I won't tell you how many years ago, but it was around this time. Um, so it's quite strange to, to be in this space as an adult. Um, I think it was a successful coming out uh, sort of thing. I don't know if anyone would describe me as a lady exactly. Um, I like to be sort of a rebel. Um, and hopefully I'll talk a little bit about um, what that means for me um, in the work that I get to do. Um, so before I start, since I am from San Diego, um, I actually had my very first research experience at the Salk Institute um, up the road in La Jolla. And I worked in a huge, huge lab. Um, at the time, I didn't know anything about research or um, what it means to be science famous. Um, and being in such a big lab with people who were working on their PhDs or had their PhDs, I felt really intimidated coming in as a science student who didn't even really know what research meant. Um, outside of just sort of just very broad definition. And yet I felt so included. I felt trusted to do the work. Um, I had a really very sophisticated research project that I worked on um, that eventually ended up winning me the San Diego um, City Science Fair and the California State Science Fair. And I never wanted to be a scientist though, even though I felt really comfortable doing that work, I felt, I, I just, I kind of wanted to do whatever I wanted to do. And I think that's kind of the point of a lot of this, right? That you give people the opportunity, you allow them to feel welcomed, included, respected, giving them opportunities so that they can build a self-identity and go on to pursue things that matter to them. So I'm really a scientist today because of the many people along the road who believed in me and gave me an opportunity and never treated me as different, even though I was the only one who looked like me in the spaces um, that I was in. So I work at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the NIH. Um, a lot of what I'll talk about today is very specific to my institute. Um, but many of these things can be applied to different places. Um, it's just important to know that NIH is sort of, it's a federated model. Each institute is like its own state, um, has its own set of governance, own priorities. So we do things differently. So it's always important to talk to an institute of where you are going to perhaps submit funding. Um, but I will talk about extramural funding, but also talk about some internal efforts, um, maybe to commiserate about some of the things that were that are happening. I will be here after the session, um, but also will be here throughout the day and again tomorrow if um, anyone has questions. So this is my office. This, these are the people that I work with. Um, we call ourselves the open office, which is kind of redundant, but we are the Office of Programs to Enhance Neuroscience Workforce Diversity. 
our goal is to open opportunities and access to enhance the diversity of the neuroscience workforce. Um, and we do act sort of as a program office, but we have our hands also in policy. We work very closely with our office of the director who sort of oversee the operations of the Institute, as well as our intramural um, research program for folks who are doing research at um, NIH specifically. And part of the reason why I'm showing you these faces is because we want to be accessible to people. We do not want to be these mysterious names, mysterious emails in the ether, that we are people that you can come to for help, trying to understand how you fit into the grand scheme of things of the NIH um, funding world. If you don't belong in the NINDS portfolio, we work really hard to figure out which institute or office that you should be dealing with. So we make it our business to be open um, truly in everything that we do. Um, and we don't want to just be names. We want to be people that you feel connected with, um, especially when we're dealing with minoritized populations or marginalized identities. So often it can be scary to reach out. Should I say something? Um, whether something's going good or bad, um, I, sh I, I don't wanna bother you. I know you're really busy. Um, and let me just say as federal employees, we are paid for you to bother us. <laughs> that is, that is what our pay, where our paycheck comes from. So if anyone tells you different, um, keep knocking on their door. Um, metaphorically speaking, don't stalk anyone. Um, <laughs> but send them emails. Do not cold call people. That's really also kind of strange. But um, all that to say, um, we are here to help you in whatever way we can. And it should be a dialogue and shouldn't just be us gatekeeping funding. It is also about finding out from you what your needs are. Where do you struggle as an institution? How do you struggle as a trainee, as an investigator, et cetera? So again, this is sort of the federated model. Uh, model. I don't expect you to even be able to read any of these things. This is really more of a, it's a pie diagram um, of how things are split up. There's different funding that goes to different institutes. Um, but I do want to mention um, that there are some NIH wide initiatives um, that are available. So there's been a lot of money being pumped into the NIH. Our budget has recently increased. There's been more money that's gone to the brain initiative to understand how the heck does the brain work? Like what is, what is that big old thing at the top of your head um, doing? Um, we also have the blueprint uh, for neuroscience research, the HEAL initiative, which is understanding pain, why people get addicted to pain medications, how we can address pain um, without using opioids and also Alzheimer's disease, which is a very um, terrible um, disease that impacts many of our aging populations. Um, but so there's, there's money to be had and sometimes it's just about you going out to get it. I don't really know about non brain things or I mean, I'm sure there's fly stuff that's being funded by this. I don't know. I've done rodent research my whole life. My very first time going into a fly lab um, as a quick detour, my friend from graduate school, it was our first year. And I was like, hey, do you want to go to lunch? And she goes, I can go to lunch, but why don't you meet me in the fly lab? I need to collect virgins. And I was like, <laughs> that is concerning. And I don't want to be part of it. So that's my extent of knowledge of flies. Um, actually really cool, it was a cool thing and I actually got to, to do a little bit of that with her. So I respect all of you that do that work. It's just, it's very foreign to me. I don't know anything about it. So um, first thinking about external DEI efforts, how we are supporting, promoting diversity, equity and inclusion in the external world or the extramural world. So, Many of you are probably aware, thinking more along the lines of race and ethnicity, um, as well as binary gender, um, that women and underrepresented folks from underrepresented groups become less and less represented as you go down the line. So all the way from an associate's degree through professorship, we see these drop-offs. And it's especially concerning um, when we're thinking about underrepresented um, groups, both in terms of women and in men. Um, and so much of how we think about funding has been motivated by these numbers and trying to understand um, how can we ensure that folks have access. And I think Todd made a really great point earlier about um, 
there's, there's a lot of nuances between all of these different groups. I also recognize just because um, you use the word Asian for a race does not mean that um, everyone from various countries are sort of represented the same in that group or because they're well represented means that they have the same types of opportunities when it comes to promotion opportunities, et cetera. Um, but this is sort of a simplification of how we're able to think about this and try to target different groups in terms of thinking, how do we um, sort of remedy some of these disparities? So one of the approaches we take, and I will say open, which works across our entire institute to do this, um, but we have been very um, intentional about the way in which we think about uh, diversity in awards. So we have individual awards and there are also institutional awards that we have. So thinking along the T line, but really R25s, which provide funding for educational experiences, not just the research, but thinking more broadly and then engaging the scientific community, whether it's directly through a funding mechanism or working with folks to be able to share information, share resources. We use Sharon Milgram all the time. We're gonna have um, her uh, give a talk um, or give a workshop on mentoring with some of our PIs, uh, but really trying to make, not trying to reinvent the wheel, thinking about how we can come together, support institutions um, and individuals, but also getting information back. How is, how is it that we can work together to ensure that we are truly creating a diverse and inclusive um, research environment? So this is a snapshot of the training programs that we have. You will be quizzed on this at the end of this talk. <laughs> um, so um, for those of you um, who are able to see the screen, um, there are some programs in green, which are talking about um, providing clinician scientist funding. Some of these blocks are in green, which are general funding opportunities that anyone can apply to. Um, well, I shouldn't say anyone is not having diversity um, information tagged to that. Uh, we have diversity programs that are outlined in purple. And then the institutional stuff we have um, are sort of, you can't really see, but there's some shading and they're all below um, the arrowed line. But this is just to show the breadth of things that we have just at NINDS and many other institutes have their own flavors. And we're thinking about this on the continuum. What do you need as a high school student, as a college student, as a postdoc? as a master student, as a PhD student, or an MD or an MD PhD student, um, and so on. So um, Todd stole my thunder a little bit talking about the research supplements, um, but I, I'm really glad that you mentioned that and how you all are using that at UCSF. I think that's a really creative idea. And part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it is that there is funding available to to offer opportunities for folks to either get an exposure to research or also to begin their research career or help their research career. Oftentimes we know that many um, students from minoritized backgrounds oftentimes have various issues into getting funding or to be able to have the right mentoring. And the way NINDS sees these research supplements is not just money, here you go, go off and do research but really taking a look at these applications and making sure that there is a true training component and a mentoring component. Just because you have someone who is um, black and non-binary in your lab doesn't mean that you're doing them a favor when you haven't really considered what they need, what they want to do with their life. Um, seeing that you just have a research, they're gonna do these experiments and then they're gonna go off and do whatever they're gonna do. Um, that's not good enough. And we really emphasize this talking with PIs, I try to get them to talk to me before they submit. I talk to them after they submit and they're rejected because they didn't think about these things is to let them know we're not going to just reward you for or, or give you this money simply to say you did it, say you had someone who checked the box, um, but that this person seems to be in agreement with what you're, what you're proposing, what they wanna do, what they say they wanna do. Um, and certainly there's always ways to get around that. Um, but when I get emails from PIs and or trainees who say, because of this funding, this person was be able to do X, they got this fellowship or they published two high impact um, journal articles. And this really made a difference. Um, and I think what we're doing is working and not just giving funding um, for these opportunities, but really making sure that we're able to evaluate it in a way that it seems like this is 
a true investment in the trainee or the candidate because they can be um, junior faculty. <clears throat> So there's a lot of different opportunities to get funding. Um, every single institute at the NIH does support the diversity supplement program. They support it differently in different ways, have different criteria, um, but certainly if you are interested in applying for that to support a student um, or you are a student and you would really like to get funding and you just don't have enough data to apply for, X fellowship, um, certainly consider this and look into it. And I'm happy to talk with you more about it um, afterwards. We also have reentry supplements that has just now been expanded to also include reintegration. So reentry oftentimes is for um, ensuring that women are not leaving the biomedical workforce due to family obligations. Reintegration supplements are often for people who have who need to leave a bad situation, whether um, it's a toxic situation or some sort of other inappropriate things that have happened around discrimination, harassment, there's an opportunity to apply for funding to move um, a student, a student or a postdoc from one lab to another, allow, especially for postdocs, oftentimes that can be a lot of work to have to start over um, and having the funding to be able to get to get up and running and have the data to be able to apply for other individual awards. And so this, I'm not going to go into detail. This isn't a grants talk, but I did wanna talk about some of the unique ways that we are addressing some of the issues we noticed within the workforce and some of the unique opportunities that were sort of being missed. And so, I think five years ago, um, the blueprint, uh, D, we call it the D-SPAN, Diversity Specialized Predoctoral to Postdoctoral Advancement in Neuroscience Award, which for those of you who know what a K99 R00 is, this is like the junior version of that. So it's giving you um, one to two years of funding to complete the dissertation, and then up to four years for a postdoc. So you're going into your postdoc with money with a research plan already available. And what this does for our um, trainees who have this is they're already starting to think about their postdoc ahead of time. They're being challenged to think about their careers um, more broadly, and then also empowered to go on to interviews. They have to do, I think, at least three interviews with different labs um, to talk about what their expectations are, really giving them more of kind of putting them in the driver's seat and not feeling like who's gonna, who's gonna allow me to come work in their lab and who's willing to train me and get me ready to, to be a big person in science. Um, and so um, these trainees really go off into the world and have they already had incredible ideas and they're emboldened to take their career into their own hands and make, make the rules for themselves. Um, and so it's also a cohort model. So they come into a cohort. And so they are getting to know each other. And then um, and now that we have, oh my gosh, I think we have eight cohorts or so now, um, they're in peer mentoring circles. So we're also giving them opportunities to help each other. Those who have transitioned to the K00 are helping those who still have the F99 thinking about what do you need to put in your budget? What should you be asking for? How do you set yourself up? for the K00s who are starting to think about um, going on to apply for a K99 or going on to the job market, talking with each other, sharing information. Um, again, this is, a, this is a diversity program, so it's for racial and ethnic minorities, um, those with disabilities and from um, disadvantaged backgrounds. And so for them to see, have to build the sense of community really helps shape their identity, but also gives them the opportunity to feel like they have control over their careers. And so we've also recently signed on to the Mosaic K99, which is a diversity focused K99. Again, there was data that shows many of the K99 um, awardees look very much the same um, and are very much not, not cis men. Um, so <laughs> how do we fix this? How do we think about this? Um, uh, what can we do? And so Kenny Gibbs, um, one of my colleagues at NIGMS came up with this program, also a cohort model. So they come in when they're awarded the K99, they are also then sort of broken up into a professional society to sort of 
I guess, uh, govern their career development opportunities and bringing them in, allowing them to have opportunities to connect with each other, connect with other professionals. <clears throat> and so this has been a, it's still getting started. I don't know if there's anyone who's yet transitioned to the R00 phase, but we're just seeing how folks feel about it, how they're just excited that all of their hard work has paid off. They're being reviewed just as rigorously as other K99 um, mechanisms. But now they know that their work in the diversity inclusion equity space is actually being valued. They have to write a diversity statement um, and not, oh, I'm, I'm a person who comes from this background, but this is how I am contributing to furthering DEI efforts at my institution and, and throughout my career. We also have the Brain Initiative K99, which is a little different. It does have, um, it is for NIH's interest in diversity, so these different groups. Um, there's no diversity statement, but we often know that in the brain initiative, many of those disciplines are very difficult, oftentimes um, very male dominated, very white. Um, so we also sort of expanded the um, criteria. You have to have less than five years, whereas a traditional K99, including the mosaic, is less than four years of postdoctoral experience. Um, this has been opened up a little bit. We're definitely seeing more women, especially with engineering backgrounds who are taking part in this program, as well as other underrepresented minorities who we hope will contribute to the overall diversity of the brain initiative. Um, this is not a cohort model, um, but they are brought into the brain PI meetings. They're again, getting a chance to meet with other folks who are doing this really sophisticated work um, and able to build a sense of identity. And similar with the very new, um, fresh off the presses, um, ADR, AD, ADRD R00, um, which also has um, a, a focus on promoting diversity. <clears throat> Another thing that NINDS has that is a bit unique is a K0, K01. Um, and I know probably for many of you, especially if you're an undergrad, you're like, what are all these letters and numbers? Exactly. What are all these letters and numbers? I didn't even know them until I came to NIH. Um, the letters and numbers don't really matter as much as what the title of it is and what you do with it. Um, many K01s, if you have heard of that um, particular letter number combination, um, are postdoctoral career development awards. Um, but our case, we have a K01 for postdocs. But this is specifically for faculty and helping get them ready um, for their first R, their first R grant. So it is for folks who are already in a tenure track position and in their first three years of a faculty position. And so this allows them to start setting up their research program um, and helping them develop and giving us an opportunity to really see what their pain points are and connecting, making sure they're connected with their program officers to be able to get ready to transition into whatever the next phase is, whether it's an R01 or something else that may be more appropriate to the institution um, they may be at or um, another type of mechanism that is more suitable to their, their needs and their interests. NIH also has on their second round of first programs, which is a cohort model for faculty hiring. Um, this has been something that has been in the works for years. I think NINDS wanted to do something like this, but now it's an NIH wide effort where there's an opportunity for institutions to be given some money with um, an agreement that they, this, the institution will also invest in hiring diverse faculty in a cohort. So again, oftentimes it can be very difficult being the only one coming into a situation, especially if there hasn't already been groundwork laid to provide an inclusive and welcoming environment. Um, this really, uh, uh, ex the expectation is on the institution to have created a culture of inclusivity. And they have a plan of making sure that when these faculty get onboarded, that they're set up for success and that they have all these different tools to be able to be successful in the first few years of their faculty appointments. And so if you are on the job market or going to be on the job market, I highly suggest you look for um, these uh, programs. I think there were, I think there were five the first round and there will be another however many over the next um, couple of years, but this is something that I'm really excited about and seeing how um, this turns out for those institutions. 
Uh, lastly, in terms of programs, I did want to talk about um, our R25s. We have summer research programs that we fund. We have um, an indoor program that matches um, research intensive institutions with um, lower resource institutions. I feel like I may have gotten that wrong, but oftentimes they are minority serving institutions or commuter um, uh, institutions that have high um, either commuters or community college um, enrollment to get them into rigorous research opportunities so that they are set up for success when they go on to apply for graduate school. And we have really great numbers that I won't bore you with today. Um, and then lastly, we have the neuroscience development um, for advancing the career of diverse research workforce, which is geared towards pre-doctoral through faculty. Again, that gives an opportunity to build community for folks to be able to come together, um, share information. So much of academic science feels like there's a secret, there's a certain way to do something. And I haven't been told how to do that thing. Um, and if you have a faculty uh, mentor who knows the secret and is willing to tell you the secret, then maybe you're good, but it's not something that's widely shared. Like, how do you manage people? We are not taught that in graduate school. You're taught how to do your science and that's about it. Um, you probably don't have people skills at that point because you're collecting virgins all day long <laughs> or running the, you know, on the microscope, doing confocal, whatever the case may be. So that's a, that's a lot to ask. So this, the idea of this is really to provide those um, opportunities. Many of them aren't secrets. They're just not things that are given to us when we come into graduate school or you know, when you're a postdoc, you're kind of like the stepchild of the university. You're not a student, but you're not an employee. Nobody cares about you. Nobody even notices when you're gone. Um, so thinking about all of those opportunities to bring people together and allow them to build a sense of identity, but also to provide them with tools that will help with their research and so on. We also have a diversity plan for conference grants. Um, and because um, I, I do wanna have time for questions, I will just say we have a huge problem with funding R01 level um, investigators who are from underrepresented backgrounds. And it is something that we need to work on. And I'm fighting like hell. I'm, I'm like um, <laughs> Shayla said, like I am the loud one. I kind of don't care what people think of me. I'm gonna keep saying we have to find ways to fund R01 level investigators, um, and, and we can't continue to use the excuse of whatever the excuses of the day of why we're not doing it and why we're not doing more. Um, and these are just some of my ideas on how to do better about that. Um, but I did want to kind of sort of say one last thing that I've been working very hard on. Um, in 2020, with the, with the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, looking around and seeing like all these people outraged um, scientists outrage about the really dismal number of black investigators having R01 funding. And I was like, yeah, it's really terrible out there, but it's also terrible in here. Like I work here and I also see how bad it is and how bad we're treated, how many promotional opportunities aren't had, all these other opportunities um, people are getting passed over for. And so I, along with some other black colleagues wrote to the NIH director, then um, Francis Collins um, about doing something about this. And so, I won't credit our group exclusively, but um, <laughs> Unite Initiative was born um, after this conversation that we had. Um, and we have continued to work to create a better space internally for NIH, but also externally and thinking more outside the box. We've now got a strategic um, plan for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility from the Chief Officer of Scientific Workforce Diversity. Um, we're also doing racial ethnic equity plans within each of our institutes, and I'm part of that. Um, as well. Um, and it's really important to me that we think more about this internally and making sure that we are doing, we can't do right by the outside world if we're not doing right by each other um, within and creating better workplaces. Um, so I, all the questions that were asked, I've asked those same questions. Or I'm trying to address them um, myself. We also use meeting rules, um, trying to be better of normalizing how to treat each other how to address things when it does happen, calling people out or calling them in if necessary. Um, and also um, I'll be working with some folks um, at my institution to create an inclusivity guide. So how do you talk about gender? How do you talk about sexuality? How do you talk about race and ethnicity? Some of these things we just don't know because we haven't been in that world or we haven't had to navigate those sorts of things. And ACS has been a real leader in this area. Um, and lastly, a shameless plug, I'm a co-host of our Institute um, podcast and season three is on mentoring. Um, a lot of it centered around culturally inclusive um, as well as 
gender and sexual minority inclusion. Um, we have some really great speakers or guests on, on the podcast to talk about different things. Not all neuroscientists, so it's for everyone, probably a fly person in there, I'm sure. Um, so that's it. Um, I'm so sorry I took the whole 30 minutes babbling, but I am everywhere and I'm so sorry about the colors. Um, they changed on my computer, they were a bright blue. Um, my email address is on the screen. I'm happy to give it to you afterwards. I'm all over Twitter um, if you wanna look for me. Happy to answer your very detailed questions about grants, but also about how we create a better space and make a louder noise. Thank you. We are super short on time. So again, I'm gonna ask people if they have questions to come up and chat. I'll ask the one question off of Zoom. And then Andy has a pitch to suggest. So if you guys hang around for one more minute, but the question off of Zoom is, are those infographics you showed uh, at the beginning, are they on the website? Can they can we get them somewhere? Um, do they say which infographics specifically? I, I think the question came in in response to the ones you showed in the beginning with like all the different programs. And oh, yes, it charts. is on the web. Um, and if you go to nindsnih.gov and go to diversity resources, it should be on there. Um, also, if you can find my email address or my um, Twitter account somewhere, I'm happy to send it to you directly. Thanks everybody for attending the session. I wanna um, just end by pitching the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee of the GSA. As scientists, we've chosen to work on hard problems that matter as you've heard from today's speakers and as you may experience in your life as a researcher and educator, inclusion and creating inclusive spaces is a, is a set of hard problems that really matter. And we wanna promote all the work within the GSA um, that, that moves us towards those goals. Um, the, the DEI committee is made up of members of the FLAG community and the other organism communities. Uh, we work in collaboration with the governance boards of the different communities and we also try to lead into new areas where maybe the communities aren't quite, aren't quite there yet. Um, and so I really wanna um, encourage you to either nominate yourself or someone else to be part of the DEI committee or uh, the GSA, uh, or sorry, Flyboard is having a, a series of inclusion grants towards the end of the year. When you see those come out, if you're doing a pilot project for in inclusion in your lab or in your department, really consider applying for those grants. Um, submit abstracts for future meetings in the DEI space. We really want to continue to encourage us all to feel like this is a, a, a part of the work always, not just a set aside, not just every once in a while. This is part of what we all should be working on together. And so any, any ways that you find in the places where you are and the tools that you have in hand to work on these issues and to connect with others who are doing the same is, um, is something that we really want to continue to encourage and support. So thank you everybody for your attention and have a good lunch. Thank you. Thank you.